going to have you turn back in your Bibles to John chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at the top of that chapter today, the verses that Adam and Victoria read for us. You know, I was going to start this off by telling a story from my childhood, or a little anecdote from my childhood, and I'm starting to freak out a little because I'm realized I'm not the only preacher in this family now, and I am a little afraid of what stories you've already heard about my family. So. <laughs> You may or may not know this already, but we did not grow up in a church-going home for the most part. You know, our, it, my dad was kind of raised in the Salvation Army, and my mother sort of in another church. But as as a rule, during our childhood, we did not regularly attend church, um, especially in early childhood. But there was a period of time when my parents gave it, our parents gave it a shot. We tried it. In fact. For a while there, we not only went to one churches, one church, we went to two different churches and kind of went back and forth between the two of them. The first church that we went to, I really liked. It, it was new and it was shiny and um, it smelled like wooden blocks because the classroom was full of blocks and it smelled, you know, you, you remember smells, right? From your childhood more than anything else. So I remember that and the smell of new carpeting and um, craft paste, you know, and it smelled like cookies and punch because they were always giving those to us. Mm -hmm. And I really liked it. The people were nice, and I liked my Sunday school teacher, and I thought that was a really cool place. Um, the second church uh, was older and a little more run down. It was always very clean, but the carpets were old, and it smelled like coffee and disinfectant, and um, <laughs> It had these old sort of metal screechy chairs and uh, you know some of the people that went there were on the rough side some of them were on the smelly side and I remember there was like graffiti on the chalkboard and um, I just remember during that period of time after a while we stopped going to the nice pretty church and we stuck around at least for a while at the other church and I didn't really understand why, because it didn't make sense to me. You know, I was just a little kid. I didn't get a vote in the family at that time. Um, you know, I just went to church where my family went to church, and I could not for the life of me figure out why you would go from nice, pretty, shiny church that smelled good, where everybody was nice and clean, to rough and tumble church where it was clean, but, you know, there were definitely some rough edges around it. You know, it didn't make sense to me. It still doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me why you would choose something uncomfortable over something that is comfortable. Why you would choose something old and run down over something that's nice and new and shiny. You know, unless you're the kind of person that likes to be a martyr of some kind. You know, you know the kind, right? The kind of person that says, oh, you take the nice comfy chair and I will sit on this hard, miserable chair that hurts my sciatica, but don't worry about it, <laughs> right? Never you mind, I'll suffer, doesn't bother me in the least. You know, there are those kinds of people out there. Um, we always choose comfort over discomfort, right? Almost except when there's some kind of reward, right? I, uh, most mornings of the week, I drag myself out of my warm and comfy bed and I go down to my nasty, icky basement um, and lift weights down there or do some kind of exercise down there or even worse, I go out into the cold, dark street and freeze to death and run outside. I don't do it because I, I get a kick out of it. I do it because I feel like I'm a healthier person for it, healthier, stronger, don't get sick as much. Um, some people study long, hard, arduous, painful hours. Raise your hand, Nichols, who just finished college. <laughs> I know you didn't do all of that for the fun of it. No, you did that to get that degree in your hand and hopefully we're praying to Jesus, gainful employment when it's all said and done. Yeah. Amen. Okay. <laughs> there are people that work really hard every day to get a paycheck, you know, straining their muscles and working really long, tough hours because they want to have food to eat and a roof over their heads. They don't do it because it's fun. They do it for the reward at the end. So you get the idea. You know, some of us have gone through nine months of discomfort and pain and misery, especially at the end, not because it's fun, but because you get the beautiful reward of a baby at the end. We give up instant gratification all the time in life 
right? To get some great reward at the end. So that's one time in life I can think of when we would give up comfort and embrace discomfort. But what if, what if your life was already absolutely perfect? What if you didn't need a college degree? You didn't need to do any of those things that we just talked about because your life was already absolutely perfect and there's not one more thing that you needed. Why would you give that up? John 1.1 1, 1 tells us, in the beginning, the Word was with God. Right? The Word in all of these verses of Scripture is a reference to Jesus Christ. And these verses tell us the Word was with God. You know, we spend our whole lives, and on the toughest of days, we say, someday I'm going to see you, God, face to face. Right? Someday. That's going to happen. But it was like that for Jesus in the beginning. He was in the presence of God. And he was not only in the presence of God, but in some wonderful, mysterious way that I can't even put into words. He was one with God. God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, together in this wonderful, harmonious unit, right? Together and, and, and united and perfect in every way. And not only all of that, not only was he with God, not only was he God, but the scriptures go on to say that he created everything. His life was already purpose, perfect and purposeful, right? Everything that he did, everything that has come into being has come about because of Jesus Christ. Do you know what I'm saying? You know, sometimes we think Jesus was born in a manger and didn't really show up on the scene until then. John 1.1 1, 1 in the New Testament tells us, not true. From the very beginning, he was responsible for the creation of all things all life and it says also all light what a perfect existence a meaningful existence and he gave it all up right why would you do something like that well it certainly was not I guarantee you for the joy as we read in verse 10 of these verses of being unrecognized by those to whom you had given life right? That was not fun for him. It certainly was not, as verse 11 tells us, for the excitement of being rejected by those whom you've created. Not fun. It certainly was not for the, the thrill of coming to this messed up planet where it's cold and it's dark and it's harsh and people are mean <laughs> And sometimes they steal from you, they take things away from you, they turn a cold shoulder to you, they are hurtful to you. It certainly wasn't for all the good stuff that he had waiting for him here on earth. So why do it? Why would Jesus give up that perfect, perfect, perfect existence and come and be with us? Here's the part of the story where I probably should tell you some neat little anecdote about somebody that really loved somebody else, some wife, some husband, some mother, some parent, some something, loved somebody so much that they gave up everything for that person. I don't have a story like that. All I have is this question for you. And you have to, you, I know you people, you have to look me in the eye and tell me the truth, okay? <laughs> have you ever in your life stuck your hand in a toilet to rescue a cell phone, a set of keys, a iPod, thank you, I'm a little tired, those words don't come so easily. <laughs> have you ever done it? Have you ever stuck your hand in the toilet to grab something precious? Come on, have you? I know I have. Yeah. You haven't? I don't have a little kid around. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but if you had dropped your keys, in the toilet, especially if it's been flushed and you got to think quick, you don't have time to go get gloves. Would you not reach down and grab it? Oops. Yes. She's you pulled out Legos. Would. Does that count? That counts. <laughs> yes. Yes, it does. Well, brothers and sisters, you are that cell phone. 
right? You are that precious item going down. And God reached down for you. I know it's not a glamorous example, but it's the best one I've got. And it's most true because the scriptures tell us that not only were you as an individual going down, all of us were going down, right? The nation of Israel, which really just is an example, a metaphor for us, right? They were going down. They were unable to get out of the cycle of sin, right? Moses, and we read this again in John chapter 1, Moses had brought them the law, and they knew right from wrong. They had been well trained in what God wanted and did not want. But it wasn't enough. The truth had been given to them, but it wasn't the kind of truth that could set them free. You know? Anybody who's ever been on a diet can tell you that there is a world of difference between knowing what we ought to do and doing it. Amen? Amen. <laughs> and that's exactly where the Israelites were, and that's exactly where we are. In that place where we know what to do, but completely unable to do it. And so the law was not sufficient. Mm -hmm. And so came Jesus Christ into the situation to not only bring us the truth, but to bring us, as verse 14 says, grace and truth. Truth wasn't enough. We needed grace and truth. And he not only brought that, he not only embodied grace, but he gave grace to us, to his people. What could grace do that truth couldn't? Well, for one thing, Verse 11 says that grace in the person of Jesus Christ could come to his own, come to us. Perfect song, stand by me, he came to us. In verse 5, we read that Jesus Christ, or that grace could shine in the darkness. Not just tell us about light from some far off place, but come and shine in the darkness to be present with us. In verse 14, we read that grace could show us his glory. So we weren't just hearing about it, but we could see it for ourselves. And in verse 18, we read that grace could make God known to us, certainly in a way that the law could never do. Jesus came and showed us who God was. He said, you know, if you've seen the Father, or if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You get it. This is, how, this is how God lives out in this place. Grace, according to verse 29, which we didn't read, but grace could take away the sin of the world. Amen? Amen. Grace could break through. And while he was separate from us in that glorious, beautiful, perfect existence, Christ could not do those things for us. It was only by coming down and being here in this dirty, messed up world that he could do what he was finally able to do. Max Lucado uh, has written a book called Grace. And in it, he talks about what this, this God who comes down, this God who not only looks us in the eye, but this God who stoops and comes down. And he shares this story about the woman caught in adultery. And you know all the story. This story is found in uh, the eighth chapter of his same book that we're reading, the book of John, right? And you know the story how the religious leaders, they have this woman caught in adultery, and they bring her before Jesus, and they throw her on the ground so that she has to look up to see Jesus, if she even dares look up from her place of shame. And then, you might remember, what does Jesus do in that situation when they ask him, what, what are we going to do about her? Well, you know what he says, but do you remember what he does before he says anything? He gets down, yeah. right? Down. He gets down lower than the leaders, lower than the woman who's been thrown to the ground. So. You can't get teary because I'll get Sorry. teary, and then it's going to be a vicious cycle. All right. <laughs> I'm not looking at you. It. You're All right. This is what Max Lucado says. I'm going to read from his book. 
We would expect Jesus to stand up, step forward, or even ascend a stair to speak. But instead, he leaned over. He descended lower than anyone else, beneath the priests, the people, even beneath the woman. The accusers looked down at her to see Jesus. They had to look down even farther. Hmm. He's prone to stoop. He stooped to wash feet, to embrace children, stooped to pull Peter out of the sea to pray in the garden. He stooped before the Roman whipping post, stooped to carry the cross. Here we go. Grace is a God who stoops. Jesus stooped to write in the dirt next to the woman, his fallen creation, touching the soil with his hands, just as he did when he formed the first man, Adam. And God stooped for you. Let me read one more quote from Lucado. He says, <coughs> He stooped low enough to sleep in a manger, work in a carpentry shop, sleep in a fishing boat, low enough to rub shoulders with crooks and lepers, low enough to be spat upon, slapped, nailed, and speared, low, low enough to be buried. Thank God he didn't stay that way, did he? Mm -hmm. He rose, and when he rose, he didn't leave us where we were. He lifted us up so that we can ascend with him to the highest places in heaven. God is not just a God who stoops because he likes being down low. He stoops because he wants to lift us up. He didn't just come down to the uncomfortable place because he likes discomfort and say, oh, it's okay, don't you worry about me. He came down to us to rescue us, to bring us back, to bring us where he is. Praise God. And so I just have a, a question for you today, and, and hopefully you've understood where we're going with this. What kind of God are you serving? Are you serving a far-off, distant, impossible-to-please God? A kind of God that you have to kind of hide from because you don't want him to see you as you really truly are, you know, or a kind of God that someday you're going to work your way up to have a relationship with, you know, if you can ever fix yourself enough to be good enough for him. Or do you have the God who stooped, who came down, who loved you so much that he wanted to be with you and would do absolutely anything for you? And the reason I ask this question is because it not only affects your relationship with God, it affects the way that you live your life and what you think it means to be the church of Jesus Christ, right? Because if you're going to follow in Jesus' footsteps, then you need to do what he did and you need to go where he would go. Do you hear what I'm saying? Do you remember my story about the two churches from childhood? You know, I didn't get it then, and I, I think I get it now. You know, the pretty church was nice. The not-so-pretty church was beautiful. It was a place that welcomed ugliness. It welcomed the worst of sinners, the worst of people, and it showed them love. It was filled with people. Oh, Laura, here we go. <laughs> oh, Captain, here we go. Oh. It was filled with people who cared less about being comfortable and less about being entertained and more about the people around them, their brothers and sisters who were hurting and needed hope and needed help and needed a savior. And what about you? Are you willing to go where Jesus would go? Are you willing to do what Jesus would do? Are you willing to give up what's comfortable and entertaining and lovely and pretty in this world to go to the dark places where Jesus is really needed? You know, go to the nursing homes, where, which are sometimes awful places. Sometimes they're okay, but you know, sometimes they're really sad, dark places. Or the prisons that we have the privilege to go to. Or the homes, sometimes the homes that we visit that are filled with anger and hate and hostility and sin. Are you willing, instead of seeking out your own comfort, 
to seek out your brother and your sister who's lost. Because that's what Jesus did. He came out of perfection to rescue us in our imperfect state. Big old lump in my throat right now. Would have sung with you, He Came Right Down to Me. Do you know that chorus? It's He Came Right Down to Me. Maybe if I talk long enough, I'll get it together. He came right down to me. He came right down to me to condescend, to be my friend. He came right down to me. The second part we don't often sing, we might not even remember, it's because he loved me so. Because he loved me so. He bled and died, was crucified, because he loved me so. So maybe if there's enough of us in the room. But you know what, the singing is not the important thing, so let's not lose where we need to be emotionally and mentally in trying to sound pretty. Where we need to be is hearing the Spirit of God. What is God saying to us, even as we sing these words? We'll sing them quietly, prayerfully. We don't need to look at each other while we sing. And then I'm going to close our time, this time of our service together in prayer. He came right down to me. He came right down. come here just out of frustration and anger because we couldn't pull our act together and you aren't waiting today for the world to get its act together before you begin to love the people who are living today your love comes first and your grace and your mercy come first mm. and I pray Lord that you will soften our hearts toward your children that we might approach people first with grace and mercy and love yes Lord we know that you long to make all of us whole and holy and pure but love first help us love first help us to love with your spirit and your heart help us to be your hands and your voice and your feet. Help us to give up what makes us comfortable for what makes you smile. Mm. And uh, give us the strength, Lord, when we're tired in our own humanity and, and we don't have anything left to give. Lord, we pray that we will give out of the abundance of the love that we receive from you. Give not out of poverty of spirit, but out of the fullness that we have in you. Strengthen us in our weakness, we pray. And Lord, in this time when we have so many opportunities to speak of you, help us to be sensitive to your spirit and say things that you would have us say, not just what we know to be true. And Lord, we just pray that you bless us as we continue to worship you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.